Hello, this is Jake Abbott. In this video, we're going to be talking about the actual time domain solution of state space equations that are uh, linear time invariant state space equations. So let's remind ourselves what those are. We're talking about linear time invariant state space equations that look like this form, where we have some x vector dot is equal to ax plus bu. And I'm explicitly indicating that these signals x, u, and y are all vectors, and that um, they're varying in time, and the matrices a, b, c, and d are not varying in time. That's what, that's what makes an LTI system. And we want to solve this equation. So these differential equations ultimately describe the the relationship that the equations have with one, each, with one another. And the x dot equation, you can say if the states are all the important pieces of information, x dot describes how those states evolve as a function of the current state values and current input values. But we actually want an equation. We want something that looks like x of t equals something. What is x of t? This is what we're going to be interested in. We want to solve that from these from these equations. Um, we also are interested in y of t, but it's pretty obvious from this bottom equation that once we know x of t, and since we explicitly know u of t because we're the one controlling it, once we know x and u, it's really easy to solve for y by just multiplying it by c and d. So solving for y isn't really the interesting part. It's solving for x that's the interesting part. So how do we take these differential equations here? This big differential equation, x dot equal to x plus bu, and solve that for x. And to solve that for x, I mean, really, we're going to say we want to solve x of t equals something given some u of t. So I'm going to control some u of t at the volume time. And I also need to know what my initial state is. So what is my state at time zero? And knowing those two pieces of information and knowing this big differential equation, I should be able to solve for x of t and how x of t evolves for all time. So there's one um, uh, little min algebra trick that we need that was, I think, covered in the Jordan form video. Um, and it's this trick. If we have this e to the at n, remember a is an n by n square matrix, and I take the time derivative of this matrix, and this was done using series expansion, you get that this thing is equal to e a e to the at, and it's also equal to e to the at times a. Um, so what we want to do is we want to go back up to our main state space equations, and we want to pre-multiply both sides by e to the minus at. I'm also going to bring this ax over to the left side, so I'm going to skip a step here just so I don't have to write so much. So I'm pre-multiplying everything by e to the minus at, x dot of t, and I brought ax over and I'm pre-multiplying, so here's e to the minus at ax, and that's equal to e to the minus at times b u of t. So I just skip one step. I brought this over to the left side, and I pre-multiplied the entire thing by e to the minus at. And if I do that, I can look at this term here, and I can recognize this is actually ddt of the quantity e to the minus at x of t by the chain rule. So if you do this by the chain rule, you first derivative of the first times the second, plus the second times the derivative of the first, and since they're matrix vector equations, you can't change the order around, and that gives you this. And so I basically have this ddt equation is equal to this equation. And then I can integrate both sides from 0 to t, where, where t now is explicitly the instant in time that we're interested in looking at. And we're ultimately trying to get this equation x at t, at any instant t. So I'm going to integrate both sides of this equation, both the left side and the right side, to get rid of this ddt. And I'm going to integrate it from 0 to t. And so that's going to give me something that looks like e to the minus a tau. And tau is going to be my variable integration. x of tau evaluated at t and tau equals 0 is going to equal the integral from 0 to t of e to the minus a tau b u at tau d tau. So if, if you don't remember how this calculus works, remember that tau is just a dummy variable. And if you take the integral of the derivative of some function f, what you really do is you just evaluate that function f at the two limits of the integration. So this has ddt in front of it. By integrating, you get rid of the ddt, and then you evaluate this thing at those two extremes. That's how you do an integral like that. OK, and if we substitute that in, what we get is e to the minus a t x of t minus e to the 0 x at 0 equals this side is unchanged, e to the minus a tau b u at tau d tau. OK. So now we need to acknowledge that this e to the 0 is the identity matrix, which we've shown before. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-multiply both sides of this by e to the at. So let's do that. So I'm going to put in e to the at here, and I'm going to put in I'll put the next sign, e to the at there, and then e to the at there. And I acknowledge, OK, this is just an identity matrix now. And this identity matrix times e to the at, just like it doesn't even exist, doesn't do anything. And then the um, next thing I want to sort of notice is this thing here, e to the at, it's not a function of tau. So as far as this integral is concerned, which is integrating over tau, it's just like a constant. So it stays, it stays completely separate from the integral. So I do a little simplification here. And I get that x at t is equal to e to the a t x at 0 plus the integral. So I'm moving this e to the a t inside, um, but, it's, but it doesn't have tau in it at all. So I have this e to the a t e to the minus a tau b u at tau b tau. And then the last thing I do is I bring these two terms together. So I have x at t is equal to e to the a t x at 0 plus the integral from 0 to t of e to the a t minus tau b u at tau d tau. Okay. I'm done. This is the solution for x of t. I look at this, and I have x of t equals and it's some function of time that needs to know my x naught value, and it needs to know my u of t all through time, from 0 up until the current time that I'm interested in. And that makes sense. I mean, as, as x evolves, it, it sort of holds on to all of the u's in the past through time. And if you think about that, you can see that this, this x naught is evolving in time by this e to the at matrix. And so as time goes on, the effects of this, maybe they're decaying away, maybe they're growing, maybe they're staying the same. And it's all going to be a function of this e to the at matrix. Then I sort of see the same kind of effect with u. I need to know all of the u's that existed from zero, from time 0 up until the time we're interested in t. And those u's come through the v matrix, which is seen right in our original state space equation. But then once they enter in, those those effects of u are also decaying away. And you can see that it's this it's the difference between the time that you're integrating, which is tau, and the current time of interest. As those become um, very big, maybe they've decayed away a lot. Or if you have an unstable system, potentially, maybe they're growing a lot. And so this is sort of accounting for the fact that, that um, past inputs have different effects on the current state value. So this here is the general solution for x of t. It isn't super clean, but it can easily be solved numerically.
But analytically, you know, this this right side, everything to do with you, is just a little, uh, you know, a little unsatisfying how complicated it is. If we don't consider the inputs at all, then then the solution for x of t is really simple, and that actually is something we can really easily wrap our heads around, like this. Just if I if I take a system with some initial state and I don't give it any input, so this is the zero input response of the system, then that's something that's very easy to analyze, and it really this e to the at matrix is very important. So uh, one thing that we should note for this general solution here, it is very easy to sort of prove to yourself. If you analyze this this equation at t equals zero, then what you get is you will get that that x at t is equal to your initial condition. So you can sort of prove to yourself quickly that this works for at least that one data point. Uh, this whole complicated equation will collapse down to just this value. So we also have this equation, right? Y of t is equal to c x of t plus d u of t. So now that we know what x of t is, and we already knew what u of t was, it's really easy to solve for y by just pre-multiplying the x terms by c. So take that huge equation we just had and multiply everything by a c on the left and then add a du on it, and then that's your general equation for y of t. I'm not gonna bother um, writing all of that stuff down. So we saw in, this, in the last slide that the solution for x of t uh, we very heavily rely on this e to the at. Now, you can go back to the video on Jordan forms, and we spent a lot of time looking explicitly at what this kind of matrix looked like. So we already know a lot about that flavor of matrix that's going to be so important in these in these state-based equations. So I'm going to write this out one more time so we can talk about it a little more. So x of d in general, and this is something that you're going to want to memorize, uh, is equal to e to the at times x naught. This is the, by far the most important part of the equation. And it also equals the integral from 0 to t of e to the a t minus tau b u of tau d tau. So this is the general equation, and we call this here the natural response of our system. And most of you will have seen uh, these sort of dynamic system equation um, terminologies before. The natural response of our system is the response if we don't do anything to it, basically we give it no input, and we just have some initial condition, and we just watch our system evolve from that initial condition. You can't say it's any based on anything but itself, because you're not doing anything to it. You're saying u equals zero, and you're just watching your system evolve. And then we call this term here the force response. And it's highly dependent on what you were giving it. If we give a sinusoidal u, usually we see sinusoidal type force responses. If we give step inputs in u, we see sort of step input force responses. Those are kind of typical behaviors. But the complete response, x of t, is going to be the summation of the natural response and the first response. So um, we're going to be, uh, for a while here, we want to talk about the natural response of systems. Um, the first response, like I said, if you're giving inputs that have a certain shape, then the first responses tend to kind of be of that shape. The natural response of a system ultimately tells you if that system is um, kind of a first order, kind of damped response, if the second order, kind of oscillatory response, if it's a stable system, if it's an unstable system. The natural response of your system is going to tell you all of this stuff. So that's what we're going to focus on for a little while. So let's do an example. And let's consider uh, a really simple equation where our x vector is an R1 vector, meaning it's just a real number. There's, it's not a vector at all, it's just a scalar. And our A matrix, in this case, is just a little scalar A. So if we do this, then our general, our general solution for our vector x of t becomes the scalar solution e to the at x naught. And I want to do that because um, you should have all seen this sort of response before. And we're going to use our existing all drops type of systems to sort of ground us and what we expect to see. So I want to, here's a, here's a plot versus time. And what I want to plot is I want to plot, let's say this is our x naught. Let's look at what this equation looks like for different values of a. So if a is less than zero, if a is a negative number, we sort of see this first order damped response where this is asymptotically going to zero. So this is a less than zero. So this is a response that we typically call it a stable response. If x, x of zero is just some number, it's just going to decay away to zero. And we can describe that decay with time constants. Uh, if a is equal to zero, things just don't change. And you can see that by looking at e to the at. If a is zero, then that's just e to the zero, which equals one. And so x of t is just equal to x naught all of the time. And if a is greater than zero, we see an unstable response where x of t is just going to grow to infinity. So this is a type of response that we've seen before. Now, let's consider another example. In this example, we're in a vector space now where x belongs to R2. So now we have a two by one vector x, and um, let's consider the case where our a is a diagonal matrix. And let's say it has two distinct eigenvalues, lambda one and lambda two. So if we look at our solution for this equation, it looks like x1 of t here, and x2 of t, I'm still using the, the general solution from the previous size, and this looks like e to the uh, lambda one t, zero, and e to the lambda two t, zero, times x1 naught and x2 naught. So when I look at this and do this actual multiplication, I get that x1 t is equal to e to the lambda 1 t x1 naught, and I get that x2 t is equal to e to the lambda 2 t x2 naught. So these two equations are completely decoupled from each other. x2 doesn't affect x1, and x1 doesn't affect x2. And each one of those decoupled variables looks just like the scalar first, first order variable from the, from the previous example. So because they're decoupled, if, if one is unstable, or one is stable, or one is marginally stable, meaning it's not growing or decaying, it doesn't affect the other one. But if you think about that this x vector is, is equal to x1 of t and x2 of t, it only takes one of these being unstable and the whole vector as a whole goes unstable. But let's say this goes, goes to infinity. Who cares if this goes to zero? The vector itself is going grow, to grow to infinity because one of its terms are going to infinity. So to kind of summarize what that means in that case, we can say if both lambda 1 and lambda 2 are less than zero, then our x vector goes to the zero vector as time goes to infinity. So basically, both of them are stable. They're both decaying away to zero. And then x, which is the combination of two, is also decaying away to zero. So if either lambda 1 or lambda 2 of, uh, is greater than zero, and of course, if both are greater than zero, it's the same thing, but only one needs to be greater than zero, then x of t goes to infinity as time goes to infinity. And then if lambda 1 equals zero and lambda 2 is less than or equal to zero, and it does, this, this order doesn't really matter, so I'll just say um, or vice versa, then x of t goes to some constant vector. 
and all this is basically saying is, you know, neither of them are greater than zero, so it's not growing to infinity, and at least one of them isn't decaying away to zero. Um, isn't decaying away. So at least one of them is equal to zero. If they're both, if they're both less than zero, then we're back to this first case. So at least one of them needs to be zero, but they could both be zero. That's all I'm saying. In that case, then this x of d goes to a constant vector. So let's consider another example. In this, in this case, um, it looked a lot like the last case. So let's consider x belongs to R2, and now a equals still a diagonal matrix, but instead of having two different eigenvalues, let's say they're the same. So it's got, it's got one eigenvalue with multiplicity two, but it does have two eigenvectors. And the reason why we know that is because this A matrix has two Jordan blocks in it, and each Jordan block has an eigenvector associated with it. So this, this matrix will have two eigenvectors, and the solution looks exactly like the solution from the last case. So we have x1 of t and x2 of t equal e to the lambda 1t, 0, 0, e to the lambda 1t, x1 naught, x2 naught. This is just exactly like the last one, and there's still two completely equal equations. The equation for x1 of t has nothing to do with the equation for x2 of t. The only difference is they have the same eigenvalue, though they're sort of evolving at roughly at the same rate, but they're still completely decoupled from each other. Nothing much has changed. So now let's do an example, though, where things are getting a little more interesting. So let's consider x belongs to R2, leaving that the same, and let's say A has this sort of form, lambda 0, lambda 1. So now it uh, still has one eigenvalue with multiplicity 2, but this is Jordan block, 2 by 2 Jordan block. So rather than the A matrix being composed of two 1 by 1 Jordan blocks, each of which has its own eigenvector, this A matrix only has one big Jordan block, and since it only has one Jordan block, it only has one eigenvector. So how does this solution look? So the general solution that we derived earlier in this video still holds. So I'm going to have x1 of t and x2 of t equals, and then what is e to the at, or Jordan block? We saw that in the Jordan 4 video, and that looks like this. It looks like e to the lambda t here, e to the lambda t here, a 0 here, and then this looks like t, e to the lambda t. And I'm going to times that by my initial condition vector. And when I look at this, my equation for x2 of t looks just like the equation for x2 of t did last time. Nothing different. And it, you see it doesn't have an x1 in there at all. It's completely decoupled from x1. But if I look at how x1 of t looks, I have e to the lambda t, x1 is 0. That looks like the, the one from the last example, but now I have this new term, t e to the lambda t times x2 of 0. So while the equation for x2 of t is fully decoupled from x1, meaning that x1 doesn't influence it at all, x1 isn't really decoupled from x2, because my initial condition of x2 does appear in x1. And, and it's only the initial condition of x2, not x2 of time. So but x2 of time starts evolving. Maybe it's stable and it days away, or maybe it's not, depending on the second value. But no matter how it evolves, x1 doesn't know that. All x1 can see is what value it had at the beginning. And it's got this weird term here, t e to the minus lambda t, or not minus lambda t, t e to the lambda t. And so what does that function look like? Let's plot that. Here's time. Let's plot t e to the lambda t. Now if lambda is less than 0, you get something that looks like this. So this is lambda less than zero. So you have this thing where at the beginning of time, it actually starts to grow. So when time is very small, the time term here dominates over the e to the minus, or e to the lambda t, and it actually grows. But after some amount of t, this thing starts going to zero so fast that even though time is still growing, e to the lambda t is shrinking faster than time is growing, and the multiplication of those two goes to zero, and eventually this just decays away. Now if lambda is equal to zero, then t, t e to the lambda t becomes um, t e to the zero, which is just t. So that's just a perfectly straight line. Like this. So that's uh, lambda equals zero. And for lambda greater than zero, I have this very uh, growing to infinity thing happening. So this is the function t e to the lambda t. And so if as long as lambda is less than 0, then you're totally fine. Whatever this initial condition on x2 is, it'll eventually, this whole term here will eventually decay away to 0 like this. But if lambda is equal to 0 or greater than 0, then that initial condition on x2 is just going to cause this term to just grow and grow and grow throughout time. So for an equation like this, it's not good enough that we have our lambdas be uh, either less than or equal to 0. They actually need to be less than 0. So uh, this is something that just falls out of this Jordan formula. It's all based on this one this one uh, term here. So the, the lesson from this is, is that an A matrix of lambda 1, lambda 0 is very different in its time response from lambda lambda 0, 0. And it's because of this other term. So we're going to see this repeated over and over throughout this semester. So the concepts we're talking about, um, I've been talking about, are R2. But the concepts we're talking about here are sort of general R to the n for, for n larger than 2. Um, they're, just, they're true for just general vectors. Um, some of the things that are important here, we, we talked about changes of uh, basis. We've done similarity transformations when matrices are diagonalizable, and also when they're not diagonal diagonalizable, but they're still similar to a Jordan 4 matrix. Um, so we have this idea that through some uh, similarity transformation, I can take, I can find some new x tilde, which is equal to t times my original x, where t is just some uh, equivalence transformation. So uh, it's some n by n real um, non-singular invertible matrix. So p inverse always exists. And I can do some transformation like this, and we've spent some time talking about this sort of thing. And just only looking at this, so we know this sort of thing exists, where p is a square matrix, p inverse exists, so we can also write p inverse times x tilde equals x. But just from looking just at this equation alone, I mean, this is just a matrix. This is just an n by a matrix that I'm multiplying x by. So if, if I know that x, this x vector is going to 0, then I also know that x tilde is going to 0, because I multiply p by a 0 vector, I get a 0 vector. The same thing goes for infinity. If I know that my x vector is growing to infinity, if x is getting huge, and then I multiply that by some matrix, then my x tilde is also going to grow to infinity. So what else do I know about this? I know if I take the derivative of both of these sides, I get x tilde dot is equal to p x dot. Uh, and I can also invert this, and I can, put, I can put dots on these like that just as well. So if I have my initial equations, x dot is equal to ax um, plus bu. And I substitute in for this. So let's let's use this equation right here and substitute that in. I get p inverse x tilde dot is equal to a, and then I'm going to substitute in um, 
that original equation before I put the dot on the for x here, and so I get p inverse x tilde plus b u, and then I multiply left multiply by p on everything. I get x tilde dot equals p a p inverse x tilde plus p b u, and this matrix here p a p inverse is a new is just a new a matrix for this system. I'll call it a tilde, and this p b is just a new b matrix. I'll just call it b tilde, and then I can carry through the same sort of um, substitutions, and I can write y now as c p inverse x plus b u. And so this, I can call this new thing a new C tilde, and then D and D tilde are just the exact same thing. So I can do this substitution, and when I'm done, I have a new set of equations where A is similar to A tilde. And what does it mean that A and A tilde are similar from each other? Well, if you remember, it means they have the same eigenvalues. It means they have the same characteristic equation. And what that really means is the time response, the fundamental time response, isn't changing. And it all comes back to this idea here. It means that if x is going to 0, then so is x tilde. And if x is growing to infinity, so is x tilde. So the, kind of the fundamental stability properties don't change through similarity transformations. If I find something out in one domain, then it'll be true in another domain as well. So what else do we know about A and A tilde? We know they have the same Jordan form, and we know that uh, the Jordan form within a Jordan form matrix it consists of one or more Jordan blocks, and those Jordan blocks can be rearranged on the diagonal without fundamentally changing the, the, matrix's, um, the matrix's properties. But, but so A and A tilde have the same Jordan form as each other, and let's let the vector V be an eigenvector of A. So A times V is equal to lambda times V, because V is an eigenvector of A. Now let's look at our similarity transformation that we had. Let's take A tilde, and let's multiply it by the transformation of V that got us to this new tilde world. So V becomes PV, and then I'm going to just plug in for a tilde, and a tilde was p a p inverse, and then that's times p v, and then I acknowledge that this thing here is just the identity matrix, and so when I'm done, that's just equal to p a times v, but um, a times v is lambda v, and so that's just equal to p times lambda v, but if I want to keep this kind of matrix vector, I'll pull the scalar out front, so it's like lambda p v. And so if you look at this, which ones are important here? I want to look at this one and this one. And so what we see there, so a and a tilde have the same eigenvalues. So lambda is an eigenvalue of a, and it's an eigenvalue of a tilde. So what this basically says is that this vector pv, and it is a vector, this is an n by 1 thing, and this is an n by n thing, so this whole thing is an n by 1 vector, pv is an eigenvector of a tilde. If v is an eigenvector of a. So this sort of relates, so if two similar matrices have the same eigenvalues as each other, they don't have the same eigenvectors, but their eigenvectors uh, can easily be found relative to each other through the similarity transformation, which here we use as p. So we now know how to find the general solution for a state-space equation, and we know that the general solution of the state-space equation, it can very easily be related through a similarity transformation to the, to the solution for the equivalent state-space equation where we've converted it into Jordan form. And we know from a previous video that uh, the Jordan form version of e to the at can very easily be solved for. So we can now